diagnosis and treatment options. When somebody comes into my office complaining of rotator cuff injury or shoulder pain, the first thing I need to know is what's the story? How did it happen? Did it come on suddenly? Was there an injury? Or did it come on gradually, gradually over many years? How does it affect you now? Does it hurt only with overhead activity? Does it bother you at night? Is there weakness? All of these are indicators of rotator cuff problems. And another question might be, what do you do for a living? I'd like to know if you're going to spend a lot of time working overhead. That may contribute to injury as well as how I would treat you. The physical examination is complex. I have a multiple point examination that I do for the shoulder, including tender spots, the range of motion, how the scapula is moving, as well as some special tests. Uh, testing for specific injuries of the shoulder for the rotator cuff, uh, slap, and other. But also I don't want to forget to look at your whole body. The uh, core strength is an important uh, contributor to shoulder pain. If you have weakness of the hip abductors or the core, you can see that the shoulder will drop, causing impingement during activities and cuff pathology. Additionally, an x-ray is helpful. Obviously, I can't see the rotator cuff itself or the soft tissue such as cartilage or labrum. However, what I can see is bone spurs. Here you see examples of three different types of acromion that we can see in the shoulder from the side, a flat, hooked, and a very hooked acromion. These are important in determining your risk of impingement. This area is where you would see bone spurs uh, if they have formed. Additionally, I can look at the spaces between the bones. I said I can't see the cuff, but I know about how thick it is and where it is. So if this space gets down uh, less than six millimeters, I know that the cuff is missing in that area. Additionally, I can look for abnormal bones such as the osacromial seen on this axillary view. This bone can be a cause of impingement as well as uh, a separate cause of pain. So that's going to be important if that's there. Of course, the MRI is my most helpful test as far as radiography goes. Uh, with the MRI, I can see cartilage, tendon, ligaments, cysts. I can even see the nerves. I'll take you through the one cut of an MRI. There's uh, up to 250 images on an MRI, and this is one. Here you can see the acromion above the shoulder, the ball of the shoulder here, the cup of the shoulder or the glenoid here, and this black tissue here is the rotator cuff. Now this is a torn rotator cuff. The cuff should extend all the way out to this bone, the greater tuberosity. So this edge should be attached here. Instead it's torn and retracted back and uh, there's fluid interposed. Here you can also see the big deltoid muscle which is responsible for lifting the humerus and here you can see the biceps tendon coming into view. Now I need to customize your treatment plan based on your physical demands. Again, are you an athlete or a heavy laborer? But also, not every tear should be treated. I need to know about your medical history. Do you have diabetes, cardiovascular disease, lung disease, or are you a smoker? All of these will affect your healing and proposed treatments. Non-operative treatment is typically reserved for isolated bursitis, tendonitis of the shoulder, maybe some partial thickness cuff tears, or full thickness tears when there's contraindications to surgery such as uh, the severe diabetes infection or other. Non-operative treatment involves non-steroidal anti-inflammatories such as Aleve and possibly steroid injections. Here you see an example of bursitis diagrammatically. This bursa, which normally functions to smooth the motion in this area, becomes inflamed. It can cause pain and crunching in the shoulder and that would respond to this type of treatment. Additionally, you've heard of rotator cuff programs. It's very important and is a good place to start for most shoulder pain. Again, you can't forget the posterior capsular stretching. I talked about in a previous video how ligamentous tightness can lead to hinging and impingement. Here you see posterior capsular stretching demonstrated. That's a very important part of a cuff program. And then there's the actual strengthening exercises for the cuff muscles to help promote that delicate balance I've mentioned several times before. 
Finally, when all that fails, or there's a large full thickness tear in a healthy patient, arthroscopic surgery may be indicated. If there's a partial tear that doesn't improve with physical therapy, surgery may also be indicated. Here we see a classic setup for arthroscopy. I use the beach chair position. The patient's seated uh, in a beach chair positioner. Here you see that there's two high definition screens, one for me, the surgeon, to look at and one for my assistant so we can work together inside the shoulder here and both have good visualization. All of the blue drapes you see is sterile. Here's what we're trying to get to or an example of a type repair we'd want to see. The rotator cuff tissue, the bone here, you can see these stitches are holding the cuff down to bone. This is a single row type repair which is an older repair. Now we perform all double row repairs which I'll demonstrate. Here you see a diagram again of that cuff tear. Here's the muscle, tendon, here's the bone, here's the edge of the cuff torn away from where it should be. Now whereas cuff surgery used to involve big incisions going all the way down the arm here, now we're able to do the same surgery through smaller incisions and even more effectively I would argue. Here's the small incisions even smaller than this now in my experience so that we can insert a camera which is angled 30 degrees, instruments to pass uh, stitches and place anchors as well as shavers and electrocautery to achieve hemostasis. Here's a diagram of what we would be doing here. Obviously the instruments change almost on a daily basis as technology improves, but you're going to have some kind of uh, placement of an anchor, prepare the rotator cuff footprint, it's called here, pass the sutures through the cuff, and then tie them down. And diagrammatically that would look like this. So let's go through a case. Here's an older gentleman who presented to me after a sharp pain while lifting a tree limb. Here you see his MRI images. Again, this is cheating. Gets me right to the, uh, the root of the problem here. He has a rotator cuff tear. The edge is pulled away from where it should be on the bone of the greater tuberosity here. Again, this is the normal deltoid muscle, the chromium here. Here you can see on x-ray the space between the acromion and the humeral head is fairly normal and that's because you can see here on the MRI the cuff is still interposed there so that's an example of how that space helps me. Here's the first picture from inside this man's uh, shoulder. You can see his biceps tendon here which is a topic of another lecture is completely torn. So uh, we shave that up to prevent impingement and pain of the biceps itself. Now, but even though he is older, you can see his cartilage is uh, fantastic. He has nice cartilage of the humeral head here and of the cup, and that's going to be important in determining his prognosis. Now we're outside of the shoulder joint, looking forward from the back, and here's the coracoacromial ligament that we talked about earlier. This is normally where your bone spur would be buried underneath that ligament, but you can see that his ligament's frayed, and I just took this picture to show how the ball of the shoulder, when it bumps against that ligament, frays it and causes uh, pain. This is a classic impingement lesion. Again, outside the uh, shoulder joint itself or underneath the deltoid looking down at his rotator cuff here you see a large tear this tissue should be attached way over here all right you can see that he's also has some uh, abnormalities of cuff tissue meaning it's not good healthy tissue however there is enough tissue there to repair this is a view from the back of that same tear I'm uh, I have prepared the footprint to bleeding bone which is very important in order to get this thing to heal. Here's a nice view from the side. You can see the cuff tear and down deep to that the ball of the shoulder and then deep to that the cup is behind there. And here's the rotator cuff footprint again that I've prepared to bleeding bone. Now I'm going to place anchors. Typically I place three to four anchors there all which are double loaded. I uh, pass those sutures through the rotator cuff and tie them down as you see here. Now this would be a si single row repair. However, I take that one step further and place anchors laterally and compress that rotator cuff footprint down to the bleeding bone that I've established and that's a really good healing scenario there. Finally, we're going to go back up to that bone spur, that impingement lesion you see here. So this image here is a camera looking underneath 
at the frayed tissue of the uh, coracochromial ligament and the bone spur deep to that. All right. So now what we're going to do is come in with an arthroscopic uh, burr and lightly shave that bone spur away. I've already taken the soft tissue away, then shave the uh, bone away. But again, if you look, I'm preserving some portion of the coracochromial ligament, which I feel is very important rather than just cutting right through that. Success rates of arthroscopic surgery uh, were clearly past uh, this beyond the argument of whether arthroscopic or open is better. Arthroscopic is far superior now. This was some older studies indicating that it was as good. Uh, now I would argue that it's far better than an open repair due to less morbidity and better visualization and that's just largely due to the technological advances in the equipment that we can use. Open repairs are sometimes necessary. Here you see an image from the 1950s again showing the massive trauma that was involved to repair the cuff. Often what would happen is this muscle would be completely paralyzed. There would be so much scar tissue in here that even though the rotator cuff was repaired the person couldn't move their shoulder. Now we make much smaller incisions uh, than that even for open surgery, maybe three to four centimeters, and, uh, but they are sometimes required in order to place a graft or do a tendon, uh, excuse me, tendon transfer in uh, special circumstances. So in summary, partial tears, bursitis, and impingement may respond to non-operative treatment. Full thickness tears and partial tears that do not get better should be repaired arthroscopically. Rarely open repairs are needed to graft the cuff or perform tendon transfers. Thank you. <laughs>